In just a moment, Suspense, starring Charles Lawton. Hi, Billy. Hi, Dad. You're working kind of late on your bicycle, aren't you? Yeah, the old bike hasn't been getting going just right. Boy, did I puff up 2nd Street this morning. <laughs> just like the car, Billy, until I had that new Autolite stay-full battery put in. Well, my boy, you just keep at it. I'm going in and coast along with Autolite batteries, spark plugs, and ignition systems on the suspense show. <laughs> Dad, if you want to listen to the Autolite show, you'd better stay out here in the garage with me. Why? Mom's got her bridge club in tonight. What? Why, yep. she doggone well knows I want to hear Charles Lawton. Buy all the drinks my stay-full battery doesn't eat, I... Take it I... easy, Dad. Here comes Charles Lawton. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Charles Lawton in Anton Leder's production of An Honest Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. that night listening to the stillness and loneliness of the empty house and tried to bring my mother back to me. Freddy, my son, I must leave you now. I know that you will miss me, but you needn't, for you are strong. I shall not be worried about you. I have taught you well. Taught me well. For the first time, the meaning of those words became clear to me. Tears dried in my eyes, my jaws clenched. That was the woman, my mother, to whom I'd been closer than anyone else in the world. Indeed, I'd been close to no one but my mother in all my 44 years. And after the tears, a flood of memories passed before my eyes. And after the memories came the realization that I was glad. My mother was dead. And I was glad. <laughs> Next day at the store, I worked in a sort of a haze of happiness and well-being. Dora smiled at me once or twice, but we were both very busy. During the rush hour, Mr. Kelsey came in to help out, as he always did. And about a quarter to ten, he said, what I realized that I'd been hoping to hear all day. You got your day's receipts totaled yet, Freddy? I'm just finishing them now, Mr. Kelsey. Yeah, then I think I'll knock off. When you get through, just put the money in the safe and lock it. I won't go to the bank till afternoon. Yes, Mr. Kelsey. You can both close up whenever you're through what you're doing. See you tomorrow. Yes, Mr. Kelsey. Good night, night Mr. Kelsey. Uh, $123.14. Check. Mr. Kelsey sure trusts you, don't he? He should after 26 years. 26 years? You've been working here that long? Sounds like a long time when you said. It doesn't seem that way to me. Well, I guess it's quitting time. Oh, boy, are my feet tired. Twenty-six years. You going to put out the lights you want me to? Oh, I'll do that. Okay. Well, I'm leaving. So long. Um, Miss, uh, Dora. Yeah? May, may I ask you something? Uh, sure. What is it? Well, uh... Oh, isn't it a beautiful night? Uh, you sure that door's locked? Oh, yes. I was just wondering... Mm. I was wondering if you'd mind if I walked home with you. It's a little out of my way. Oh, sure. Oh. Why not? Oh, but, Sid, don't you have to get home to your mother? Oh, gee, Freddie, I'm sorry. That's all right. Must have been a terrible blow to you. Yes. It was. And you taken care of her all that time? Twenty-six years, but you mustn't think that that was a hardship. You see, I owe everything in the world to my mother. Everything that I am or ever will be. Oh, I know what you mean. I always say, a, a person's Ms. mother... Dora, I've never told this to anyone. Say, but I I've been meaning to ask you, the way you always call me Miss Dora, and I mean, the way you talk, it's so refined. Really? <laughs> 
I bet you had a real good education once, didn't you? No, not formally. But you see, my mother was a governess, and she always tried to give me the same advantages as she would the children under her care. My mother was a highly educated woman. Well, I knew it must be something like that. Anyway, you don't have to call me Miss Dora. I mean, <laughs> seeing we're kind of old friends. Oh. Uh, say, what was it you was going to tell me before? Oh, that was something about my mother. Something she taught me. I, I'll never forget uh, it as long as I live. You happened to remind me of it when you remarked how Mr. Kelsey trusted me. Well, what was it? Uh, well, it was just before my 11th birthday... There was a motion picture that I wanted to see very badly. Actually, it was something about cowboys, I think. But my mother said we couldn't afford it. And so I, I took ten cents from her purse, and she found it out. What'd she say? Well, she uh, whipped me. It was the only time she ever did, uh, until I could hardly walk. <laughs> she said I'd done the worst thing that anyone could ever do, that I had been dishonest. I was a thief. <laughs> <laughs> you dishonest. Oh, that's a laugh. I never knew anybody more honest in all my life. Well, look at the way Mr. Kelsey yes, always... Yes, but only because of what my mother taught me. I've been grateful to her all my life. That I always will be. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, they say honesty is the best policy, and I guess it is all right, but... Now, you take Tom Bass. What about him? Well, I wouldn't exactly say he's dishonest, but... He's sure having a lot more fun than you or me. But, Dora, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree that there are more important things in life than just having fun. Oh, sure, of course. I didn't mean it like that. And what I mean to say is, you, you, you couldn't admire a fellow like this Bass, could you? Tom Bass? Oh, I should say not. He thinks he's so smart with his wisecracks and his cheap jokes. I wouldn't give him the time of day. Is there anyone, that, that is to say, any man... You do admire? Yeah, not me. Oh, I admire you, of course. Do you really? For sure. <laughs> but if you mean, do I go out steady with anyone? Uh-uh. Uh, have you ever thought of the kind of man that you would go steady with? My dream man? <laughs> oh, sure. But you just don't find them growing on trees. Not that kind. What kind, Dora? Oh, when I say dream man, don't get me wrong. I don't go for those glamour boys. I've been around enough to know better than that. You just give me a nice, easy-going fellow with a steady job. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds like a description of me. <laughs> and a little money put away in the bank. That's the kind of fellow I want. Did you say money? Well, sure. A fellow's never going to get very far if he doesn't have a little laid aside for a rainy day. Oh, yes. Uh, Isn't that right? Yes, I suppose that is right. But uh, how much money do you think such a fellow ought to have? Oh, thousand dollars. You know, just something for kind of a little nest egg. Little, oh, yeah, yes, 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 of course, yes. Well, here's where I live. Thanks for the walk. Dora? Yeah? If you were to find such a man... Who? A man with a steady job and money in the bank. Oh, him. I mean, I mean, would you would you consider, I mean, would you... Uh... Would I what? Oh, oh, I get it. Well, sure, if I thought I could make him happy. Oh, I know you would. Why not? Well, till uh, death do us part. <laughs> <laughs> It was strange that she should have said that when death had parted me only a few brief hours before the, uh, from the only woman in my life, my mother. And now so soon after there was another woman, but here she was there. The, the, that that thousand dollars, that stood in the way. With all the expense of the funeral still to be met, I knew that it would take me at least two years to accumulate such a sum. And Dora was a warm, attractive girl. I couldn't expect her to wait that long. It wouldn't be fair, so by... By the next morning, my first fond hope had turned to black despair. I hardly noticed Tom Bass when he sauntered into the store. Hiya, honey. Well, you know what's new. Oh. Oh, hello there. What do you say, Freddy boy? I beg your pardon. <laughs> what's the matter? You in love or something? Say, remember that horse I told you about last week? Horse? You remember Revelation. I told you to get down on him at eight to one. Oh, yes. Well, what did I tell you? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I have had a number of things in my mind lately. He won, chump. He won, just like I told you he would. 
Now, ain't you sorry you didn't get a couple of bucks down on him? Oh, yes, yes, but really, I don't know very much about horse racing. Never too late to learn. Say, give me a hot pastrami on rye, will you? Uh, mustard? Yeah. A little lettuce? No, skip that. You want it to go? Or can... I'll eat it here. Say, how come a guy like you ever learned to make such good sandwiches? They're the best in town. No kidding. My mother taught me. Is that a fact? My mother taught me everything I know. Yeah? Say, it must be good to feel like that about your old lady. I haven't seen mine for ten years. Here you are. Thanks. Is your mother dead? No. I just took a powder when I was a kid. I couldn't stand it around there anymore. You couldn't stand it around your own mother? Yeah. All she ever did was yap, yap, yap. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Finally, one day I told her what she could do and I beat it. But how could she get along without you? What did she do? I don't know. Same old thing, I guess. Work in the laundry. Say, yeah. Look, Freddy. <laughs> pay her for the sandwich tomorrow, okay? All I got to 50. Well, if you won't forget, I, I, I did have to remind you last time, you know. I, I have to take it out of my own pocket. <laughs> You're a good guy, Freddy. Say, in fact, you know what? I think I'm going to let you in on something. Oh? Freddy, listen. I got a tip so hot it's burning the seat of my pants. Hmm? Avalanche in the third at Santa Rosa today. Strictly a drugstore job. What? They're going to give him the needle. I got it from his trainer myself in person. Avalanche can't any more lose that race than I can sing high C. You know what the odds are? A hundred to one. A hundred to one. A hundred to one. That's what I said. Do you you mean to tell me that if someone were to bet ten dollars on this horse, they'd win back a thousand? You ain't just bird calling you put a tenner on that beetle and you'll have 1,000 bucks in your hot little hand by tonight. Oh, I wish I could, but I don't have $10 or anywhere near it. I, I don't get paid until One tomorrow, eight, you out see. Of five. Oh, out of five. Here you are, Dora. Thanks. Hey, Freddie. What's the matter? Yeah. You can always lay your hand on a ten when you want it, can't you? I can. How? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. That's Mr. Kelsey's money. Oh, not till tonight. What Mr. Kelsey don't know, he's going to hurt him. Oh, no, oh I, I couldn't do anything like that. Okay. I'll be back. But think it over, friend. One thousand skinner roots, and that ain't horse feet. One thousand skinner roots. <laughs> Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Charles Lawton in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Dad, I don't know what's coming next, but this story's got me in the mood to expect anything. Yeah, anything but invite a woman's bridge party in on Thursday night. (laughs) Still thieved at Mom, Dad. Well, I... Cheer up. This car radio's operating hunky-dory. Thanks to your new Autolite Stay Full battery. Besides, Mom's partner probably just trumped her ace. So, uh, let's listen to Frank Martin, the Autolite announcer. Yes, the new Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. This greater liquid reserve practically eliminates one of the major causes of battery failure. Car owners tell us it's the greatest battery ever built. The greatest battery ever built. Money cannot buy a better battery for your car. You know, Billy, the boys over at the service station tell me that these Autolite Stayfuls are really setting up some long time between drinks records. Yeah, Dad, I guess it's like having a camel under your hood, huh? <laughs> oh, better than that. An Autolite Stayful only needs a drink three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, see your friendly neighborhood Autolite battery dealer and order the new Autolite Stayful battery for your car. It needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And there are the important advantages of extra plates and fiberglass insulation that means so much to long battery life. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Charles Lawton as Freddy in An Honest Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Of course, I could think of nothing else all morning. My mind was in the world. A thousand dollars with a thousand dollars I could propose to Dora. I could propose to her that very night. At the same time, was the appalling thought of what I'd have to do. I, I would have to take ten dollars from the cash register. 
ten dollars that was not mine, that would be stealing. I, I would be a thief. But as I thought, I wondered. Perhaps Tom Bass was right. It wouldn't be stealing if I put the money back. And by tonight, I'd have the thousand dollars. I could put it back. But that was it. That was the difference. Why, I'd taken the money from Mother that time. I had no prospect of replacing it, but this way, this, this way, it, it, the, so the next time I went to the cash register to make change, I slipped ten dollars out of the drawer and put it into my apron pocket. <sighs> After that, I found I was perspiring and my hands trembled <laughs> so, so that I nearly cut myself a dozen times working at my sandwich board. And I saw Tom Bass coming through the door. Tom! Tom! Yeah? What's the matter? Tom! I've got the ten dollars. Ten dollars. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, now you're getting smart. Give it to me. I'll place it on. Hey, but Tommy, you sure? Are you absolutely sure? I tell you, the nag is in at a walk. I got a few skins down on this one myself. Don't oh, forget. All right, but when will I get the money? Six o'clock tonight, the latest. I'll bring it around myself. Give me the ten. Yeah, I, you, you won't forget, will you? Forget? With a thousand bucks in my kick, how could I forget? Relax. You got nothing to worry about. Freddy. What was you and Tom talking about just now? Oh, he was just telling me about some horse or other. Well, you better be careful how you talk to him about horses. Why do you say that? Well, that's the way he makes his living, ain't it? Yes, <laughs> I should rather imagine it is. Oh, Dora. Yeah? Would you care to, that is, when we're through work, would you, would you care to go somewhere with me this evening? Go where? Oh, why, Freddie, are you asking me for a date? <laughs> yes, I suppose I am. Oh, Freddie, that's real cute. I might even take you up on you, it. You mean that you will, you, you will go? I might. I'll <laughs> tell you at quitting time. Why can't you tell me now? Oh, something might come up. What could come up? I don't know what could come up. Anything could come up. One of us might drop dead. <laughs> it's a strange sense of humor, Dora's. But I, I get used to that, you know. Anyway, she had practically said yes to the date, so I, I passed the rest of the afternoon busy with thoughts of the good fortune that was awaiting me. At five, Mr. Kelsey came in, and shortly thereafter there was a rush of customers that took up all my attention, so that it was with something of a start that I looked at the clock and saw that it was nearly 6.30. But Tom had said six no later than six. Still, it was quite understandable that in a transaction of such magnitude... He might have met with some unforeseeable delay, so I tried to compose myself to remain calm and to wait, but the minutes and then the hours passed. By nine o'clock, I was in such a state I could hardly conceal it, and yet I had to. I had to, and then suddenly at 9.30, I saw him. He was walking rather hurriedly, I thought, along the opposite side of the street, and throwing caution to the wind, I dashed from behind the counter and out of the door. Tom! Tom! Oh, hiya, Freddy. <laughs> For a minute there, I didn't recognize you. I'm so sorry to trouble you this way, but it was so late, I thought you might have forgotten. Uh, no, no, I, I didn't forget. Did you have the money with you? Uh, look, uh, Freddy, I've been meaning to come in all evening to tell you about that, but uh, I didn't know how to say, say it. Say what? Uh, it's getting so you can't trust nobody nowadays. Believe me, kid, I feel as bad about this as you do. Well, 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 well Tom, that what That lion trainer, he never done a thing to that horse. The bum come in last. I mean that we lost it. My money's gone. Yeah. Lost. Oh, don't take it too hard, kid. You stick with me and I'll have that ten back for you, double and triple, by the end of next week. You know, somebody wins, somebody loses. You know, take it easy now. Mother. Mother. Help me. I'm a thief. I turned back to the store automatically, but even now, I could hardly grasp the full extent of the catastrophe which had overwhelmed me. All I knew that tomorrow was payday, and I could only prevent Mr. Kelsey from finding out until then. What there. happened to you? Uh, what was that, Mr. Kelsey? You looked like you'd seen a ghost or something. You went charging out of here a couple of minutes ago. Oh, yes, I thought I saw someone I knew, someone I'd known as a child. Oh, yeah. That happens to me all the time. Does it? Well, it's pretty late. You can both beat it if you want to. I'll check the receipts tonight myself. Hey, what you doing? I dropped uh, a knife. You want us to go? Yeah, you might as well. I'll be here late anyway. I'll close up. Well, that sure don't make me mad. Oh, gee, I've been ready to drop for the last hour. Mr. Kelsey, I'd be glad to check the receipts for you. You don't have yeah, to... Yeah, I know, but I got an order to come in tomorrow. I got to go with the books for the last six months. 
Seems I got some kind of beef with the tax people. Oh, come on, Freddy. Let the boss do a little work for a change. Anyway, I thought you had other plans for tonight. Yes, I did, but, uh, Mr. Kelsey, I'd rather you let me do it, really. It wouldn't be any trouble. Well, if that's the way it is, I'm leaving. Uh, shove me over that ad machine before you go, will you, Dora? Yeah, sure. Uh, night, Mr. Kelsey. Night. Dora. Good night. Mr. McWilliams. What's the matter with her? You two been having trouble? Oh, no. Mr. Kelsey, hmm? I do not like to have you checking the receipts all by yourself. I don't like it either. But it's got to be done. You run along now. I'll see you tomorrow. But I don't want you to do it. Look, Freddy, thanks for trying to help, but just leave me alone, will you? I ain't got a lot of work to do tonight. No. Stop. Say, what's eating you? I told you once. Now, I've always done it before. It makes me feel that you don't trust me. Oh, you see. Freddy, what kind of way to talk is that? <laughs> I've been trusting you for 26 years, haven't I? Why should I stop tonight all of a sudden? Mr. Kelsey. Hmm? Uh. 118.37. Hey, that's funny. We're $10 short. See, I knew what he would say next. I knew that I had to stop him before he said that awful word. Ten dollars short. Now, how could... Freddy, what are you doing? Freddy? Freddy! I washed my hands most carefully at the sink and dried them on my apron... And I bent over Mr. Kelsey, or, or rather, <laughs> Mr. Kelsey's body, and, and, and I removed from his pocket the sum of $32.50, the exact amount that would be owing to me in salary on the following day. Of this sum, I put $10 in the cash register. Then I left the store and went home. It was all right now. Everything was all right. I was not a thief. <laughs> I was so exhausted that I got home and just dropped and just dropped in my bed. I, I must have fallen asleep that way because I was fully clothed when I was awakened some hours later. Yes, yes. Well, 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 who is it? It's me, Dora. Let me in. Oh, yes, of course. Oh. oh, Freddie, I'm so glad I found you. You've got to help me. You've got to do something. Why, of course, my dear. What can I do? Freddie, Mr. Kelsey. Mr. Kelsey's dead. Oh, yes. I'm sorry that had to happen, Dora. Believe me, I am. How can you stand there and be so calm about it? Freddy, he was murdered and they got Tom for it. They say he did it. They got him down at the police station right now. Tom? Tom Bass? Yes. Tom said he was just going by the store and he saw the lights on and he went in. And then he found Mr. Kelsey there with a, a knife in him and he didn't know what to do and just then the cop on the beat walked in and they arrested him right there. Well, I can hardly believe a man like Tom Bass could have any good reason to kill Mr. Kelsey. Oh, that's what I said. That's what I've been telling the cops for the past hour. He may be a little shady, I said. Well, he may have done some things that wasn't exactly right, but my boyfriend wouldn't commit murder, I said. He wouldn't. Your boyfriend? Yeah, I said... Oh, gee, Freddie, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to... Yes, but you told me that there was not anyone. Well, there, there wasn't, honest. That's the truth. I, I'd just been out with him two or three times. I didn't know he meant anything. I, I didn't even think I liked him. But when I saw him down there and I saw what they were doing to him... Your well... boyfriend. Oh, Freddy, please. Please, don't be mad at me. I, oh, I was half crazy. I didn't know who else to come to. you got to do something for him. Dora. What? Do you love him? Yeah. Yes, I do. I see. Well, I left her there and started for the police station. Tom Bass meant nothing to me, of course. He meant less than nothing now. But, of course, Dora, that was something else again. I, I didn't know exactly what I should do, but the sergeant helped me to make up my mind. Well? I 
understand that you have a prisoner here who is accused of killing one Henry Kelsey. That's right. You his mouthpiece? Oh, no, no, no. I am... I, well, at least uh, I, I was an employee of Mr. Kelsey's for 26 years. Mac Williams? Frederick Aloysius Mac Williams. Yeah, we know about you. We may want to ask you a few questions tomorrow. But you got nothing to worry about. We got our man. You have all the evidence you need? Of course we got all the evidence we need. Well, why would we be holding him? Mm. We caught him red-handed. And he's got a record since he was 14 years old. Oh, dear, 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 dear me. But supposing that I had positive evidence that the prisoner Tom Bass did not kill Mr. Kelsey. This had better be good, I'm warning you. Uh, tell me, it would be uh, dishonest to withhold that information, wouldn't it? You're doggone tootin' it would. I mean, you see, it would be like stealing, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it, it would be stealing. It, it, it's stealing another man's life. But are you trying That's to kid way. somebody? No, no, no. I've never been more serious in my life. All right. If you know so much, who did kill Kelsey? I did. <laughs> I'm afraid she'll have to wait a year for Tom Bass. It seems the police frown on his method of making a living. Well, as for me, a great calm has settled over me. Oh, such a calm as I've never known before in my life. Soon I shall be joining Mother. She will smile when she sees me. And I know that she'll be proud of me and she'll understand. She'll understand that whatever faults I may have had, I was not a thief. Thank you, Charles Lawton, for an extraordinary performance. Mr. Lawton will return in just a moment. Say, Billy, Charles Lawton was certainly in the groove tonight. I'll say. Hey, Dad, here comes Mom. I just thought you two'd be out here puttering you and your bikes and batteries with Charles Lawton on the suspense program, too. Mary, did you listen to suspense? Of course I did. You're always talking about your Autolite Stay Full batteries, so I thought I'd listen to suspense and get the real back. What what about the bridge club? Oh, they came early so we could all listen to Charles Lawton. Uh, My guests are just leaving now. Well, Dad, I guess we men can't win. What do we do now? Why, finish your evening right, gentlemen. Listen to the Autolite announcer signing off. So remember, folks, Autolite Stay Full needs water only three times a year in normal car use. That's another reason why everybody is switching to Autolite Stay Full batteries. Autolite means batteries. Stay Full batteries. Autolite means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. Here again is Mr. Charles Lawton. It has been a great pleasure to appear again on Suspense. And I'm certainly looking forward to listening next week when Anne Southern comes to the microphone as a deceiving wife who learns a lesson the hard way. It is a story titled Beware the Quiet Man. And it's a gripping study in... Suspense. Charles Lawton may currently be seen in Paramount's The Big Clock. Tonight's suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Luskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Anne Southern in Beware the Quiet Man. United States Coast Guard on the celebration of its 158th anniversary this week. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, suspense with Ann Southern. 
Silly, turn that radio down. How can we play bridge? Okay, Ma. I like the auto light show, but not so loud. Whose deal is it, May? Mine, Mary. My husband Ed always listens, too. When he's home on Thursdays, our house sounds just like his service station. I know what you mean. Tonight's probably spark plug night. You'd think the announcer with his commercials would be enough, but no. It's switched to auto light resistor. Spark plugs. <laughs> I know. Batteries and ignition systems. <laughs> Well, Dora, what are you dreaming about? Oh, Autolite? You mean the show with Ann Southern? Oh, Mary, tell Billy to turn up the radio again. I wouldn't miss the space for will all... you turn the radio up, your Aunt Dora? Yes, went... ma'am. And its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Ann Southern in Anton Leder's production of Beware the Quiet Man. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> Soda with a twist of lemon. Okay, coming right up. Say, your name Margie? Yeah. How'd you know? You generally come in here with a heavy set guy, black wavy hair, wears a tie, big diamond? Yeah. Yeah, he was in a while ago. Said to tell you he'd be late, but for you to be sure and wait for him. But I can't wait. I gotta get home to my. I gotta get home. How late do you say it'd be? Oh, about an hour. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, give me some nickels. Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Hello? Mr. Banning, please. Yeah, Mr. Arthur Banning. <laughs> Arthur? Margie. Uh, I- I'm going to be late for supper. Yeah, uh, I ran into a girl I used to know at Lincoln High. She wants me to have a drink with her. Yeah. And say, will you pick up some hamburger on the way home and start the potatoes? I'll be there as quick as I can. Bye. Uh, Here's your drink. Well, here's mud in your eye. Um, uh, there's a young fella down the end of the bar wants to buy you one. No, thanks. Well, it looks like a nice guy. That tall blonde fellow over by the mirror? None other. And you got a whole lot to kill. Is he... He isn't drunk, is he? No, nah, he's had a few, but he always carries it good. I might help pass the time. Say, what's it to you anyway? Five bucks. You say, I sure appreciate it. He offered you five bucks to get me to have a drink with him? Yeah. <laughs> he is kind of good looking. Well, okay. Sure, what the heck, I'll have a drink with him. Okay, so you're married. Nothing wrong with having a drink together, so what? I figure what your old man don't know won't hurt him. I said I'd have a drink with you. If you've got any other ideas, I'll buy my own. Oh, now, don't get me wrong, honey. I spotted you as a good kid the minute you ankled in here. You just like excitement, that's all. And I'm the guy that can dish it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, I'm a private eye. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Like you hear about on the radio. Gee, what a break for me. You just stick around me, honey, and you'll get plenty of excitement. Yeah, I'll bet. You know, you take this new client of mine now. Bet you anything he makes the headlines tomorrow. <laughs> Ten to one, or he'll murder his wife. Oh, yes, sure. He hired me to find out if his wife's been stepping out. I felt kind of sorry for the guy. He probably doesn't have the money to take her out himself. He's a bank teller at Second National. Bank teller? Bank teller? My... What's his name? 
Oh, honey, no, no, that, that stuff's confidential. Matter of fact, I, I'm not supposed to talk about cases at all. Oh, go on. I won't tell anybody. Well, no, you don't look like the kind of babe that blabs everything she knows. How about that drink, huh? Sure. Hey, Charlie, two over here, huh? In the works. You know, he sort of gave me the creeps, this guy. He sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, and all the time figuring how to kill his wife. How'd you know what he was figuring? Well, for one thing, he didn't want evidence for a divorce. He sort of looked at me funny and said, I just want to know, that's all. If Margie is stepping out, I'll take care of it my own way. Margie? Yeah, yeah, that's his wife's name, Margie. Hey, what's the matter? Uh, Nothing. Nothing at all. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you drank the last one too fast. No, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just naturally pale, that's all. You were saying about this client? You figure he's going to murder his wife? Oh, sure, sure. It's in her back. Either that or suicide. Suicide? But he's more the type for murder. Oh, one of those big, brutal guys. Sort of of mean looking, huh? No. Quiet, mousy. Kind doesn't have much to say. Those are the guys you got to watch. But why? Because they never let you know what they're really thinking. Not until it's too late. They don't? You know, most guys, when they find their wives stepping, will raise cane. Maybe they'll even get a divorce, but they don't get sore enough to murder. <laughs> yeah. But these quiet fellas, you know, they put the little woman on a pedestal. You wouldn't catch them out with other women, not in a million years. And when they discover their one and only has been kicking up her heels, oh, brother, watch out. Golly. And the worst of it is they go on acting like nothing's wrong, you see. And then all of a sudden, wango, they... Explode. They explode? Yeah, yeah. You know, like I always say, beware the quiet man. Like this new client of mine, for example. Calm. You never met anybody calmer, but i What does bet... he look like? Oh, uh, well, he's just about average, I guess. Brown hair, getting sort of thin on the top. A little bit stoop-shouldered. Medium height? Wear glasses? Yeah, yeah. You know him? No. No, I, I don't know any of the boys. Excuse me. Hey, where are you going? i got to make a phone call. Just remember something. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Ralph? Margie? I can't see you this afternoon. No, I'm not sore about you being late. But whatever you do, don't come into Charlie's place. Yeah, that's where I am now. You bet there's something wrong. There's plenty wrong. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Anne Southern in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. We're down 200 on that hand. Oh, are we? It's easy to see there's no playing bridge with you girls with suspense on. So let's stop playing and switch to Autolite spark plugs or whatever for the rest of the half hour, huh? Oh, Mary, I could kiss you. You're such an understanding sister-in-law, and I don't want to miss a single word. What about you, May? Dora, did you know that my husband knows Frank Martin, the Autolite salesman? He does? Mm -hmm. Well, then let's listen to Mr. Martin. Right now, you can get Autolite resistor spark plugs almost anywhere in the United States. They're sensational. Why, no other spark plug will give and maintain such performance. Autolite worked with leading car and truck manufacturers, and they ignition engineered a 10,000 ohm resistor right into the Autolite spark plug that permits a wider spark gap setting and maintains it far longer than in other spark plugs. Actually, when you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. Oh, dear. And to think that I'll hear every word of that again from Ed when I get home. Now, here's the simple lowdown. As a result of the wide gap in the resistor spark plugs, your engine idles smoother, you have better luck with lean gas mixtures and save gas. And within established limits, you reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Yes, and today you can get the resistor spark plug from almost any of Autolite's 60,000 dealers. That's the biggest spark plug news in years. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Ann Southern as Margie 
in Beware the Quiet Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I stood there in the phone booth a minute after I hung up. I wasn't scared exactly, but I had to let those words sink in. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. I went back to the bar. I had to find out. Oh, beautiful. I thought you got lost. Sit down, sit down. Mm. Thanks. Now, about this fella, the one who's going to murder his wife. Oh, let's can the shop talk. I want to hear about you. I don't even know your name. Did he say what made him think she was stepping out? Ah, she's supposed to belong to some bridge club. The bank teller's wife's got up. But, uh, friends of his saw her downtown a couple of times on her bridge days. Is that all? You know, honey, you're pretty smart. You, you, you make like you're really interested in a guy's work. Oh, but I am. You know, I had a little doll once. I thought plenty of... W- Would have married her, maybe, but... Only every time I, I started talking about a case, she shut me up. Never mind about your little dolls. What about this guy? <laughs> hey, you're jealous. Well, what do you know? I'm not jealous. I only want to know. It's okay, honey. It's okay. Sure, a cute little doll like you doesn't want to hear a guy spotting off about another dame. Yeah, maybe I had a few too many. I just want to hear about this bank teller. Have you met his wife, maybe? No, but he showed me a picture of her. Oh, then you know what she looks like. Oh. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? <laughs> Never mind the joke's on me. <laughs> hey, maybe you better not have many more to drink. You're acting kind of screwy. Oh, I feel wonderful. Well, here's to you. A long life. Yeah. A long, long life. Yeah. Down the hatch. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Poor little Margie. You know, you showed me a snapshot of her in a bathing suit. Mm-hmm. Oh, boy, was she stacked. As a matter of fact, uh, about your height and uh, build, they're yeah, blonde like you, too. Was she as pretty as I am? I, I couldn't see her face. It's kind of blurred. He, oh. He's bringing me a better picture of her tomorrow. Oh, I think I'd like another drink. You know, honey, you better start taking vitamins or something. You're pale as a sheep. I said I wanted another drink. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, uh, Charlie, two more the same, huh? Okay. Yeah, poor little Margie. You know, that's one thing I could never figure out. The cute little dolls with flirtatious eyes always pick some homely, quiet gink when it comes to settling down. And the handsome he-man who has to beat off the dames with a club, what does he do? He marries a drab little pigeon. Yeah, that's why we get so many axe murders, I guess. Axe murders? Only in this case, he'll use a gun. But he doesn't have a... I mean, most bank clerks don't own guns. Oh, well, this one does. Now. Uh, Give me a light, will you? Yeah, sure. There you are. Hey, maybe if you lay off a booze, honey, and take a tonic or something, you'll feel better. Uh, Look at your hands. They're trembling. How do you know he has a gun? Oh... Oh, I get it. <laughs> Why don't you tell me? Tell you what? You got a squeamish stomach. Oh. All this talk about guns and shooting. No, honey, I'm sorry. I, I won't say one more word about it, I promise. I'm not squeamish, and I don't need vitamins. I want to know how you know this bank teller guy has a gun. All right, so I'm going to a pawn shop and buy one. Oh. You know, honey, I, I could really go for you. It's a funny thing. We never even introduced ourselves. That's something we got to do. My name's Closen. Lem Closen. What's yours? You you mean that man bought a gun and now he's home waiting to murder his wife in cold blood? Oh, no, no. He won't do anything until he gets my report. Oh. You see, tomorrow I check with her friends to see if she's been going to bridge club like she's supposed to. Yeah. And I meet my client for lunch and get a picture of Margie. Mm. And I take it around to the downtown bars to find out if she's been seen with anybody. And then I give my client the report when he gets off work. Yeah. And then? And if his suspicions are right, and they usually are... It's all over but the shooting. The shooting? Yeah. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. (sighs) Say, uh, what'd you say your name was? I've got to get home. (sighs) Hello, dear. Hello, Arthur. I was beginning to worry about you. Well, uh, I really couldn't help being late for dinner. 
I wanted to leave, but Maybell, that's her name. You know, the girl I used to go to school with, she kept talking yatta to yatta, and I just couldn't walk out on her in the middle of a sentence. That's all right. I didn't mind. Hey, the potatoes are all ready like you told me. Shall I... Uh... No, no. I'll hurry dinner. You just sit down and read the paper. Huh? Well, well thank you, dear. You all right? You're... You look a little flushed. Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I was just rushing, that's all. Uh, it'll be ready in a minute. Uh, did you have a hard day, darling? Oh, usual. People are taking out more money these days than they're putting in. Yeah, prices are awful, aren't they? Hmm. Nothing unusual? I mean, nothing happened today? Oh, a, a funny thing. Man came rushing in this morning, first thing the doors were opened. Wanted to withdraw all the money from their joint account before his wife beat him to it. Seems she was leaving him for another man. Oh, how awful. Oh, yeah. While he was there, she appeared. You should have heard her carry on. <laughs> she was a real shrew. Well, what happened? Oh, nothing. He didn't say a word. He, he was a gentleman. But I'll bet if he'd had a gun, he'd have killed her. <gasps> oh, well. <clears throat> Seems things like that happen all the time. Newspapers full of it. Are you mad at me, Arthur? Hmm? Are you mad at me? Am I mad at you? Why, no. Should I be? Arthur, darling, I've, I've got something to confess. Well, fire away. I didn't go to Bridge Club last week. No? I thought you'd die before you gave up Bridge. Oh. Really, honey, you look awfully seedy. No, I'm fine. I, I feel fine. I... I had sort of a quarrel with Lorraine. I, I, I didn't want to tell you because you're always talking about how women can't get along with each other. Instead of going to Bridge Club, I went shopping. Instead. Oh, fine. Only I hope you didn't go over the budget. Oh, no. That's good. I always said Bridge was a waste of time. Then you're not angry about anything? Why, no. Why should I be? Oh, Arthur... What's the matter now? I don't deserve a swell husband like you. Oh. oh, I'm not so hot. Oh, you always do the dinner dishes and bring me my breakfast in bed on Sunday mornings. The only morning you have to sleep. Arthur, I'd feel terrible if anything ever happened to us. Well, what's going to happen? Suppose someday you got real mad and exploded. Exploded? Yeah. What if you, what if you got a gun and shot me dead? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Margie. Where do you get those crazy ideas? You mean, no matter how mad you got... No matter what I did to make you mad, you wouldn't shoot me dead. Uh, Margie, you know I'd rather die than hurt one hair on your head. Oh, well, they're not suicide. Say, how many drinks did you and Maybelle have? Arthur, I want you to know I'm going to change. I'm going to be a better wife from now on. I'll stay home all the time and darn your socks. You? <laughs> Darning socks. You just wait and see. <laughs> I'll get up every morning and, and make your breakfast. Oh, uh, Margie, you know you won't do any of those things. I will, too. The nonsense. Women like you never change. I will, too. I'll change right away. Tomorrow. Besides, I don't want you to. Oh, come here, baby. I want you to stay just exactly the way you are right now. Just exactly, Arthur? I love you very much. Just the way you are. Oh, Arthur. <sighs> that reminds me. I made an appointment for you tomorrow at 10. You're having your picture taken. My picture? I showed a fellow that old snapshot of you today. The one we took at the beach. Oh. was so dog-eared he couldn't see what you looked like, and I realized we didn't have a single decent picture of you at all, so But, I... but why have it taken tomorrow? Well, the studio next to the bank is having a special advertising the new 60-minute service. 60-minute service? Yeah. That way I can pick up the finished picture before I go to lunch. I don't want my picture taken. Well, now you're being silly. I won't. I won't do it. Oh, well, honey, what's the matter? Don't touch me. I won't have my picture taken. I won't. Good night. <gasps> Sort of gave me the creeps, this guy. Sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, and all the time figuring how to kill his wife. <laughs> Quiet, mousy. That's the kind you gotta watch. Never let you know what they're really thinking. All of a sudden, wango, they explode. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Arthur wouldn't hurt me, he wouldn't. I won't think about it. I'll take a sleeping powder and go to bed. The gun. He did buy a gun. It's all true. Every word of it's true. <laughs> Hello? Ralph! 
I told you never to call me here. No, no, it isn't all right. Arthur brought a gun home last night. Yes, a gun. Claimed he was keeping it for a friend. That's all he'd say. Yeah, I, I think so. Just a minute, I'll look. Ralph, the gun's gone. He must have taken it to work. Oh, but don't you see? As soon as he finds out for sure, he'll kill... No, 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 no. I never want to hear from you again. I've got to think. I've got to think. Oh, not the door, girl. Oh, Lorraine. Well, who'd you expect, darling? Frankenstein? Aren't you going to invite me in? Well, I, I was just going out. Don't be silly. You're not dressed. I'm in a hurry, Lorraine. I... So am I. I'm late at the beauty shop now. But I was driving past anyway, so I thought I'd drop in and give you the latest on the girls at the bridge club. Oh, some other day. I've, I've... Honestly, Margie, this is choice. You know what I heard about Mrs. Dentler? You know, she's the wife of Ben Dentler, the new teller at the bank. The one from Chicago. Lorraine, if you don't mind. Oh, that's right. You haven't met her. Of course, you haven't been around lately. Well, she's kind of a pretty little thing in a plucked eyebrow sort of way. But, but it's... you should hear what her husband told my husband. Lorraine, I... Of course, I promised Ed I wouldn't breathe a word. But crying out loud, Lorraine. What? What brought that on? I haven't time to stand and gossip. What's wrong with you today, anyway? You're as nervous as a cat. I'm all right, perfectly all right. But here it is, 10.30. 10.30? Good heavens, I'm a half hour late. Well, goodbye. I've got to run. Oh, darling. Be sure and read the Gazette tomorrow. They're running a story about our bridge benefit. Okay, goodbye. Pictures and everything. They didn't have time taking a new picture, but I gave them when we took the Valentine party. The one I was in? They're publishing it? Why, sure. I don't want my picture in the paper. But yours was the only flattering one in the group. The reporter picked you out right away. He seemed quite smitten. He? Oh, yes, yes. He asked all about you. Of course, I told him that you didn't come to meetings very often. The Gazette doesn't use men reporters for society? Well, they do now, dear. He didn't sound much like a reporter, though. He kept calling me honey. Tall, blonde, fast talker? Well, uh, yes. And you gave him my picture? Well, of course. What was his name? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, yeah. Funny name. Mm -hmm. I think it was Clusen. Lem Clusen. <laughs> But, Charlie, it's a matter of life and death. I've got to get all of them before noon. Well, like I said, he ain't been in. You sure he never told you where he worked? No, he's come short for some private detective office. Oh, give me some nickels, lots of nickels. i got some telephoning to do. Ask me, Detective Agency. Do you have a man named Clusen working for you? Lem Clusen? No? Thanks. Brandon Agency? I want Mr. Clusen, Lem Clusen. Oh, yeah, I guess I have the wrong number. Hawksaw Detectives, I'm looking for a man named Lem Clusen. No, I don't want to hire you to find him. But you're the last one in the book. He's got... Okay, sorry. No luck? No. I just remembered. Lem said the guy he worked for just opened up in town. Probably ain't no phone book yet. Ixtree, read all about it. Go on, kid, get out of here. Frank Teller, suicide. Ixtree, read all ah, about it. Ah, that fresh kid, just because I won't let him in here peddling his papers, he yells in the door. Did he say bank suicide? He yells in here every darn day. Oh. Hey, wait, wait. Hey, you didn't finish oh. your drink, huh? Hey, Newsy. Newsy. Oh, I told hey, boy. I hey, newspaper. Hey, boy. Give hey, me a book, boy. Read all about boy. it. Frank suicide. Hey, you, boy. Paper lady? Did you say suicide? Right in the Second National Bank. You want a paper? Yeah. Here. Guy's wife steps out with another joke. So the poor dope says goodbye, Marge, and pulls the trigger. Hey, yeah, lady. Frank suicide. Read all about it. Well, well, if it isn't Margie. Get away from me, Lem Clusen. Heard you were looking for me. Well, here I am. Boy, have I got a lot to tell you. Let me alone. I want to read. Oh, that write-up's no good. Here, give it to me. Yeah, that's better. Now, come on into Charlie's and I'll give you the insight. Give me though. back my paper, you you murderer. Murderer? Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I get it. You figure he bumped himself off on account of my report. <laughs> that's a screwy part. He didn't even wait for the report. I got it right here in my pocket. Take your hand off my arm. Oh, look, honey. Now, come on. You're coming into Charlie's if I have to drag you. Why don't you leave me alone? Yeah, I figured you'd be sore. 
might spartan off the way I did in Charlie's yesterday. But how did I know who you were? Oh, here we are. Hey, Charlie, yeah. two bourbon highs double. I don't want a drink. Should have seen my face this morning when that screwy friend of yours gave me the picture of your bridge oh, club. Oh, never mind. And there you were, as real as life and just as cute. I says to myself, why, you dumb ox, you got that little doll worried sick. And then when I read in the paper about my client giving your husband the gun to keep for fear he'll use it on himself, I think, holy cow. What did you say? And then I think, I bet she figures I planned the whole thing just to scare her. What do you mean? Oh, now, don't try to kid me, Margie. You know you figured that client of mine was your husband, that he was going to bump you off. You mean he wasn't? No, no, your name's Banning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my client's name was Dentler, Benjamin Dentler. <laughs> Funny thing, his wife being named Margie, too. Yeah, I never thought he'd do it anyway. Oh, I think I'd like that drink after all. Well, here's to us, honey. So that's the gossip Lorraine was trying to tell me. Dentler, the teller from Chicago. You know, I've been thinking a lot about you. And Margie. Arthur really was keeping the gun for a friend of his. Hey, I'll tell you what, honey. I know a quiet little spot across town where we can eat, dance, anything we want. He might have told me about Dentler. It's a cute little place, baby. They got a knocked out band and what a floor show. I wonder why Arthur wouldn't talk to me about it. Well, what do you say? Say? To what? Well, you and me, honey. I date. Oh, <laughs> you're asking me to step out with you? <laughs> well, why not? How about my husband? Oh, that mousy little guy. We got nothing to worry about from him. But I thought you always said, beware the quiet man. You never know what they're really thinking. But this is... No, but. If you'll pardon me, Mr. Lem Clusen, I'm going home and start his supper. <laughs> Thank you, Ann Southern, for a splendid performance. Miss Southern will be back in just a moment. Dora, I apologize. That show was better than a six-no-trump hand. Why, Mary, first thing you know, you'll be in Ed's class, quacking about autolite resistor spark plugs like Donald Duck. Deal me a great big hand, Mary, and watch me get back that 200 we went down. You know, I must get me a set of those spark plugs. Why not? Ask Ed tomorrow to put a set of those Autolite resistor spark plugs in your car. Oh, well then, May, will you tell Ed I'll be over tomorrow? I certainly will. My old car is going to get Autolite resistor spark plugs, too. Yes, switching to Autolite is safe, sane, sound, sober judgment, and a sure way to spark plug satisfaction. That's why everybody's switching to Autolite. Autolite means resistor spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition systems. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Miss Ann Southern. Hmm. I've enjoyed this appearance on Suspense very much. And as a regular Suspense listener, I'm looking forward to next week when Martha Scott stars in Crisis. A powerful study in... Suspense. Anne Southern appears by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, producers of Julia Misbehaves, starring Walter Pigeon and Greer Garson. Tonight's suspense play was written by Toby Hall, with music composed by Lucian Morawick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Martha Scott in Crisis. This is the Autolite Suspense Show, calling the people of the USA. Here's your party, sir. Thank you. This is Care Incorporated. It's been nine years now, nine years since Europe's people have been able to live decently, buy clothes to wear, get enough to eat. That's a long time. It's far too long. Our government is doing something about it. Its long-range program will help restore economic prosperity. But there won't be any immediate direct help for the people who are hungry today. They can look only to us, to you and me. We can send help through CARE, 
The 40,000 calories of food, good food, in a care package goes a long way. Because care is non-profit, government approved, it will deliver your package in Europe for just $10. $10 sent to care will supplement rations of a family of four Europeans for a month. Won't you help? Remember the name and address, CARE, C-A-R-E, New York. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, Suspense with Martha Scott. It's time for the Autolite radio well, show, Mom. you better wake your dad up. And I know darn well he won't want to miss <laughs> You're it. You're right. Hey, Dad. This will get him. <laughs> Dad, who makes the stay-full batteries? Uh, Autolite. And who makes spark plugs and complete ignition systems for your car? Uh, Autolite. And what radio show do the Autolite people put on over CBS every Thursday night? Uh, what? Hey, it's time for suspense. <laughs> Switch on the radio, Billy. The radio's on, dear. Just be quiet and listen. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Martha Scott in Anton Leder's production of Crisis, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Sorry, Doctor. I fell asleep. I told you not to. I warned you. Oh, I couldn't help it. Let me see the baby. Uh, how is he? Mm-hmm. Is he better? Well, pneumonia's tricky. Temperature 106. Oh, all day long it's been 106. If he'd only move, if he'd only cry. Oh, Doctor, you've got to do something. Mrs. Norquist, get hold of yourself. Fasten that sheet down. It's important that you don't let any of that steam escape. All right, it's just that I'm so tired. When will the nurse be here? There won't be a nurse. No nurse, but you said there... I've tried everywhere. It's the worst epidemic since 1918. The hospitals are full. Oh, but I can't go on without a nurse. I can't... Well, isn't there someone who can help you? Some neighbor? There's no one. Well, what about your husband? When's he due back? Two or three days. Maybe you'd better send for him. You... You don't mean the baby. Well, you can't keep this up. You need help. Oh, I didn't want to worry, Paul. This business trip's so important to him. Besides, I expected to get a nurse. Why, he doesn't even know the baby's sick. Uh, You'll have to do it alone, then. How's the sulfur holding out? I have enough. Good. Now, don't neglect the steam for an instant. Keep up the warm alcohol sponge bath. Don't leave his side. I'll, I'll try to get back in the morning. And don't sleep. No matter how tired you get, no matter how you scream for it, you must not sleep. Here. Here, take these pills. They'll help you. Thank you, doctor. Doctor... Is little Kurt going to make it? Well, that you'll know one way or the other before morning. Oh? Crack that temperature tonight, and he'll pull through. It's the crisis. Poor baby. Little thin legs. 
Kick the covers, darling. Kick them. That's what legs are for. You don't want to give up now, Kurt. You're just beginning. You haven't seen half there is. You've never thrown a snowball or hit a home run or gone fishing with your dad. Oh, Kurt. Kurt, you should be in a hospital. Not in a homemade croup tent with a kettle of steam under your bed. In a hospital with with nurses in white starched uniforms. Nurses who are awake, whose hearts don't break when they look at you. I, I mustn't think about it. Steam. A kettle under the bed, steam to breathe. Another kettle on the stove. Sponge baths every few minutes. Every few minutes. Temperature, 106. Temperature, 106. Temperature, 106. How many times I took it, I don't know. Nothing in the room seemed real or tangible anymore. Nothing but the steam. Steam. I watched it, hypnotized. Now it was an eraser on a blackboard removing today's problems. Now it was a windshield wiper pushing aside the rain so I could see ahead of me. The vision slowly cleared. And then I saw it. A light. No, six lights. Bright flames. Birthday candles. Six birthday candles on top of a white cake. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, little Kurt. Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. <laughs> Six years old. You're a big boy now, son. <laughs> I want my presents. Oh, how mercenary little creature, isn't he, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Muggy, here it is. Hey, son, let me help you. Leave it alone. What? Don't you dare touch it. Oh, now look here, Kurt. Please, Paul, it's his birthday. <sighs> All right. Go ahead, unwrap it. Well, Kurt, don't you like it? No. Oh, why, Kurt Norquist, how can you say such a thing after your daddy bought you a wonderful fire engine? Why didn't you get me one with one seat? But what's wrong with two seats? When it's got two seats, you got to let some other kid ride with you. But don't you want to share your fun with your little friends? I don't like nobody to have fun but me. Kurt, you come back here. Let him go, Paul. Oh, but He's Mary. just a little boy. He'll get over it. Well, I, I hope so. There were more birthdays, but as Kurt grew, a mounting fear began to grow in me, too. He looked like a choir boy, but there was something else hiding back of those innocent eyes. At eight, he forged his report card. At ten, he stole some things from the dime store. By the time he showed promise of being taller than his father, his personality, in spite of everything we tried to do, was really beginning to frighten us. You wanted to see me, Father? Uh, yes, I did. Your mother and I are very concerned about you. Again? Why weren't you in school all week? It bores me. Well, where were you? What have you been doing? Thinking. Just thinking. What about, Kurt? What is it you think about? Is there something bothering you? Yes. Well, what is it, son? School. I hate it. But you like to read. That's different. I read what I like. I don't like to be told what to do. But don't you understand? Everybody has to be guided and told what to do. Sure, I understand. But I don't have to like it. And I don't like it. Kurt, I'm surprised at you. Is that all, Father? Yes, yes, that's that's all. I'm disappointed. I thought you were going to beat me. Why, you insolent... Oh, Kurt! Please, please. There's someone at the door. What? Why, Mr. Johnson. Kurt Helm? Well, yes, he is. Hello, Paul. Oh, Fred. Well, what is it this time? Are you going to tell them, Kurt, or do you want me to? I don't mind. I stole a watch from Evans' jewelry store. A swell wrist watch. A watch? Oh, Kurt. We were going to buy you one for your birthday. You, you didn't have to steal it. It was more fun stealing. Lots more fun. This time I'll have to take him to juvenile court, Mrs. Norton. Oh, no. Fred, 
Fred, let, let me bring him down. You go on. I want to talk to him. Paul's face was gray with hurt. His cheeks sagged and his eyes were bleak as he turned to Kurt. I didn't want it this way, son, but maybe it's the only solution. Maybe it'll help straighten you out. You're not going to put me in a reform school. Kurt! Kurt! Paul was savage as he ran up the stairs after him. Kurt slammed the bedroom door in his face, and as Paul flung it open... You've had this coming to you for a long time. Oh, no, you don't. Keep away from me. Kurt! Wild lust was on Kurt's face, and a gun was in his hand, his father's revolver. I knew he'd do it even before it happened. Kurt! Paul went limp as he turned to me with a look of shocked surprise. Mary! <laughs> Paul! Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Martha Scott in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Whew. If that didn't wake you up, Dad, nothing will. Wake me up? Why, I wasn't asleep a while ago. I was just fooling you. Fooling, huh? <laughs> then tell me what I said. Just before Suspense started? Yeah. You asked me who made the Stay Full battery. Naturally, I said Autolite. And when those Autolite people named it the Stay Full battery, they weren't talking through their hats either. Why, that battery needs water only three times a year. Get that, Billy? Only three times a year. <laughs> Golly. What's more... That's fine, dear. But don't you think you ought to let Mr. Martin give the commercial? Yes, folks, what Hap says is true. Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. This means less trouble and care for you. For Autolite's greater liquid reserve practically eliminates one of the major causes of battery failure. Car owners everywhere tell us the Autolite Stay Full is the greatest battery ever built. So, friends, visit your neighborhood Autolite dealer and get an Autolite Stay Full battery for your car. Enjoy the advantages of extra plates and fiberglass insulation. It means so much to long battery life. And remember... Autolite Stay Full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. No doubt about it, money can't buy a better battery for your car than Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Martha Scott as Mary in Crisis, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Visions continued to rise out of the steam clouds. I found myself sitting beside Paul's bed. He was out of danger. Accidental shooting while cleaning a gun. That's what Paul told the doctor. I wanted to tell the truth, but I wouldn't hurt him any further. No, Kurt didn't go to the reform school. We hushed that up to lies, lies suffocating us. We shrank, Paul and I, crawled into our shells, confused, disillusioned, afraid of our only son. But Kurt grew, and so did his misdemeanors, until he was a handsome giant with the face of a Viking saint and no soul at all. The incident with Elaine McGregor proved that. I was transplanting geraniums on the other side of the hedge. I didn't mean to eavesdrop... What's going to happen to us? I wouldn't know. Doesn't it make any difference to you? <laughs> Should it? It's easy for you, isn't it? What did you expect? I... Nothing, really. You're in a class by yourself, Kurt. You've got the heart of a tapeworm, but you're not going to eat into me. Very pretty speech. I didn't know you were so valuable. But uh, what does it mean? It means I'm lucky. I can walk out of your life. You can't. You've got to live with yourself. You're rotten, Kurt. Rotten all the way through. You warp everything you touch. You destroy all the decent things around you. <laughs> decent? I despise you. I thought you loved me. Madly. You can't love a snake. You can only be charmed by it. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Mother, you can come out from behind there. 
How could you? Mother, I knew you were there all the time. I didn't mean that. I mean the way you treated Elaine. Oh, Kurt, maybe, maybe marriage would be good for you. Come, come, Mother. First you want me to get a job, any job. Now, you wouldn't want me to get married at my age, would you? I'm just a child. No, Kurt, not you. You've never been a child. Everything he did seemed to be aimed at hurting someone. And always it pleased him. And then one day, as suddenly as you turn over a page, Kurt was different. He slammed the front door and he was whistling. He was gayer than I'd ever seen him. Well, what are you so gay about? The proverbial leaf has been turned. And you see before you a hard-working young man. Kurt... You've got a job. That's right, Mother. A job. Oh, at the lumberyard. Oh, don't be silly. I'm a banker. A banker? What bank? First National. Mr. Cox was very nice about the whole thing. Your father's bank? Then Paul got you the job. You talk like the old man owns the place. He's just a teller. Then how did you get the job? I talked to Mr. Cox. Kurt... What did you tell Mr. Cox? You should have been there, Mother. I melted the old boy's heart. He swallowed the whole thing. Swallowed what? What did you tell Mr. Cox? Don't get melodramatic, Mother. I merely told him that I had to go to work because we needed the money. That I liked the idea of working in a bank. You know, like father, like son. Oh, needed the money. Oh, Kurt, you didn't. You didn't humiliate your father that way. But you wanted me to get a job. Kurt, ever since you've been old enough to think you've been bad... You caused your father nothing but heartache. You're aging him, draining all the joy out of his life. And now this... this crowning humiliation. But I'm warning you, Kurt. If you cause your father any more sorrow, if you hurt him just once more, I'll... I'll... Kill me? Bravo, Mother. Now, now let's have the second act. You... you feet! <laughs> the first time I ever slapped him. But I knew then there would never be any peace for us. That he would go on and on until there was nothing left. No honor, no decency, nothing. But even I didn't suspect the depth of his malignancy until... Paul was coming up the walk alone. His step was slow, his back was stooped, and his face was lined and tortured. I, I opened the door for him. Paul, Paul, what's wrong? I've been fired. Fired? After 22 years? There was a shortage this morning. A thousand dollars. A thousand? Oh, surely they they don't think you took it. Uh, You've handled millions of dollars down there and never touched a penny of it. How could... Kurt took it, didn't he? Yes. And you took the blame? Not exactly. He's very clever, Mary. He's devilishly clever. He worked hard. He did his work well. I thought... I tried to kid myself anyway that he was outgrowing his badness. It was all part of a warped scheme. He won the respect of everyone in the bank, and Mary simply stole the money and planted the evidence that led straight to me. Why didn't you tell Mr. Cox what we've been through, what a bad boy he is? There are records at Juvenile Hall. We, we could prove it. You know what Mr. Cox said to me? He said he wouldn't prosecute because of my wonderful son. My wonderful son. I never had a son. I couldn't look at him, Mary. When I walked out of the bank, Garvey and Cage One didn't even say goodbye or good luck or too bad or anything. He just got suddenly too busy to look up. He forgot all about the months we lay in the mud together at Taro and the Navy Crosses. We went on the same day. Garvey was too busy to look up. I couldn't tell him the truth. I'm not strong like you, Mary. Can't take it anymore. He was looking at me, but he didn't see me. His eyes were covered with a film of tears. Then he turned and staggered out of the house. He walked like he was drunk. Yes, that's what he was drunk with despair. 
He got in the car. I wanted to go to him, to hold him in my arms, but I couldn't. I was frozen. The car lurched away from the curb, skidded around the corner. It was like a mad man driving. I wasn't surprised when they called me from the hospital. Reckless driving, they said. Accidental death. But I called it something else. I called it murder. At that moment, I died too. Oh, I went through the motions of living at the cemetery and after. I kept on, not counting the days coming or going, and... And one day, I realized Kurt was 25, a man, a handsome, ruthless man. We lived in the same house, but we had nothing to do with each other. Until one November afternoon, I was in the kitchen making an apple pie. It it had always been Paul's favorite. Suddenly, the room was throbbing with Paul's presence. Paul! I dropped the knife on the floor and ran up the stairs into my bedroom. Mine and Paul's. I was wild out of my mind. I turned about the room, everywhere searching. I needed him terribly. I could feel his presence, and yet it wasn't enough. It had to be something tangible, something I could touch. And then I remembered the Navy Cross and the Purple Heart. They were his. They were part of him. I pulled out the shirt drawer and threw his shirts on the bed. The Purple Heart was there in its satin line box. But the Navy Cross was gone. Oh... Paul. 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 The room was dark. I lay there for quite a while. I had no reason to get up. Kurt was home. I tidied the bed, spread it up, ran a comb through my hair. I walked along the hallway to his room. Yes? You want something? I'm in a hurry. Yes, I do want something. Your father's Navy Cross, where is it? Oh, that. I was holding three aces when I ran into a straight. Jack Carnes said he'd take the cross in lieu of five bucks. How do you like a guy like that? I looked at Kurt for a long time. Then I walked away. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Not that day or any other day. Not even later when the policeman came to the door. I have a warrant for the arrest of Kurt Norquist. On what charge? Murder. It was a colorful trial. Murder in the first degree. The front pages were blotched with it. Little shop girls hurried to buy the evening editions of the sordid testimony to read on their way home from work. I went to the trial every day and listened with with this strange sense of unreality. Sure I killed him. All I could think was that flashing, handsome young man up there admitting to murder and worse is my son. No, I didn't hate him. I didn't even know him very well. Then why don't I feel anything? I just wanted to see what it was like. That's all. Why don't I shudder with disgrace? Why don't I crawl off into a corner and die? Sorry? What for? He's dead, isn't he? The trial went on for days, and Kurt was unmoved, insolent, triumphant almost. Even as his wretched soul made ready for the lethal chamber, he was untouched. In there, madam. Five minutes. Thank you. Well, hello, mother. Mother? Oh, yes, I am your mother. Huh? Oh, you brought me some cigarettes. Thanks. Well, I wonder what it's going to be like. What? You know, that last mile... I'm a queer guy, all right. I don't feel sorry about anything. As a matter of fact, I don't feel anything at all. Never did. 
Except that maybe this is a good smoke. I looked deeply into his face, beyond the pale blue eyes, into the black soul. I gave him life, but I couldn't give him honor. He exhaled. Smoke came out of his mouth and nose and spun around him, enveloping his face, framing it in a circle of fog. Then he smiled. Not the smile of a murderer, more the slow, wistful smile of a small boy. And abruptly, his face was changed. I've been here before. I watched the smoke rings as they billowed upward. I couldn't take my eyes off them. And each smoke ring was a face. Kurt's face. And the faces kept changing, getting smaller, smaller. The eyes were round, full of wonder, changing, and slowly the vision faded. They all converged into one face. And Kurt was a baby again, in a croup tent, fighting for the right to live a useless life. I've seen ahead. That's what it was. I know what's in store for him, and it's all bad. Steam. Steam. Not much left. In a moment, there won't be any. Oh, let him go. He'll turn out bad. No good. Not worth my tears. It won't be wrong. Let him go. Steam. It's gone. I won't get the kettle. It isn't wrong. Let him go. No. Oh, no, little Kurt, wait. Don't go. The steam. Kettle. Get the kettle. Don't take him, oh, please, don't take him. He's just a little baby. He doesn't know. Steve, I must take his temperature. Oh, I'm afraid. Crisis. Temperature, 106. Six tenths. 107. Oh, no, no. He's gone. He's gone. He's dead. Kurt Kurt You're alive Hold on, baby Hold tight I got my way as I held the thermometer to the light I brushed them off And then I looked The mercury stood at 106, 105, 103. You're going to get well, Kurt. Temperature 101. And grow strong and handsome. Temperature 100. And good, Kurt. You're going to be good. Martha Scott for a splendid performance. Miss Scott will be back in just a moment. Billy, would you mind getting me a glass of water, dear? You ought to install a stay full battery, Why, Mom. Billy. Sure. Then you'd only need to take a drink three <laughs> times a year. <laughs> oh, you men. Can't you talk about anything but that auto light battery? Now, look, honey, if you wanted to go downtown tomorrow morning and the car wouldn't start, you'd be pretty mad, wouldn't you? Why, of course I'd be mad. Sure, so would anybody. That's one reason why we have a stay full battery in our car. And listen to this. Yes, friends, auto light stay full batteries are designed to save you trouble and care by practically eliminating one of the major causes of battery failure, lack of water. You see, auto light stay full batteries need water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, When it comes to automotive electrical parts, Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means spark plug. Ignition engineered spark plugs. 
Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Miss Martha Scott. It's been a real pleasure to appear on Suspense tonight. You know, I never miss hearing the program whenever possible, and I'm going to make a special effort to be at my radio next Thursday night when Van Heflin stars in a story called Song of the Heart, a gripping study in... Suspense. Miss Martha Scott is currently appearing in the RKO production so well remembered. Tonight's suspense play was written by Gwen and John Bagney with music composed by Lucian Marowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Van Heflin in Song of the Heart. This is the Autolite Suspense Show. Drive carefully. Save a life. It may be your own. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My mother was dead, and I was glad. All the next day at the store, I worked in a sort of a haze of happiness and well-being. Dora smiled at me once or twice, but we were both very busy. During the rush hour, Mr. Kelsey came in to help out, as he always did. And about a quarter to ten, he said, what I realized that I'd been hoping to hear all day. You got your day's receipts totaled yet, Freddie? I'm just finishing them now, Mr. Kelsey. Yeah, then I think I'll knock off. When you get through, just put the money in the safe and lock it. I won't go to the bank till afternoon. Yes, Mr. Kelsey. You can both close up whenever you're through what you're doing. See you tomorrow. Yes, Mr. Kelsey. Good, Good night. night, Mr. Kelsey. Uh, $123.14. Check... Mr. Kelsey sure trusts you, don't he? He should, after 26 years. 26 years? You've been working here that long? Sounds like a long time when you've said. It doesn't seem that way to me. Well, I guess it's quitting time. Oh, boy, are my feet tired. 26 years. You gonna put out the lights or you want me to? Oh, I'll do that. Okay. Well, I'm leaving. So long. Um, Miss, uh, Dora. Yeah? May, may I ask you something? Uh, sure, what is it? Well, uh... Oh, isn't it a beautiful night? Uh, you sure that door's locked? Oh, yes. I was just wondering... Mm. I was wondering if you'd mind if I walked home with you. It's a little out of my way. Oh, sure, oh. why not? Oh, but say, don't you have to get home to your mother? Oh, Gee, Freddie, I'm sorry. That's all right. Must have been a terrible blow to you. Yes, it was. And you taken care of her all that time? Twenty-six years, but you mustn't think that that was a hardship, you see. I owe everything in the world to my mother. Everything that I am or ever will be. Oh, I know what you mean. I always say, a, a person's Miss mother... Laura, I've never told this to anyone. Say, but I I've do... been... Hello there. Well, say, Freddie boy. I beg your pardon. <laughs> What's the matter? You in love or something? Say... Remember that horse I told you about last week? Horse? You remember Revelation? I told you to get down on him at eight to one. Oh, yes. Well, what did I tell you? Well, to tell you the truth, I, I have had a number of things in my mind lately. He won, chump. He won. Just like I told you he would. Now, ain't you sorry you didn't get a couple of bucks down on him? Oh, yes, yes, but really, I don't know very much about horse racing. Never but... too late to learn. Say, give me a hot pastrami on rye, will you? Uh, mustard? Yeah. A little lettuce? No, skip that. Do you want it to go, or you can... I'll eat it here. Say, how come a guy like you ever learned to make such good sandwiches? With the best in town. No kidding. My mother taught me. Is that a fact? My mother taught me everything I know. Yeah? Say, you must be good to feel like that about your old lady. I haven't seen mine for ten years. Here you are. Thanks. Is your mother dead? No. I just took a powder when I was a kid. I couldn't stand it around there anymore. You couldn't stand it around your own mother? Yeah. All she ever did was yap, yap, yap. Huh. Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? Finally, one day I told her what she could do, and I beat it. But how could she get along without you? What did she do? I don't know. Same old thing, I guess. Working the laundry. 
Say, uh, look, Freddy, <laughs> pay her for the sandwich tomorrow, okay? All I got to 50. Well, if you won't forget, I, I, I did have to remind you last time, you know. I, I have to take it out of my own pocket. <laughs> You're a good guy, Freddy. Say, in fact, you know what? I think I'm going to let you in on something. Oh? Freddy, listen. I got a tip so hot it's burned in the seat of my pants. Hmm? Avalanche in the third at Santa Rosa today. Strictly a drugstore job. What? They're going to give him the needle. I got it from his trainer myself oh. in person. Avalanche can't any more lose that race than I can sing high C. You know what the odds are? A hundred to one. A hundred to one. A hundred to one. That's what I said. Do you, do you mean to tell me that if someone were to bet ten dollars on this horse, they'd win back a thousand? You ain't just bird calling. <laughs> you put a tenner on that beetle and you'll have one thousand bucks in your hot little hand by tonight. Oh, I wish I could, but I don't have ten dollars or anywhere near it. I, I don't get paid one until tomorrow, you see. Out of five. Oh, out of five. <laughs> Here you are, Dora. Have you ever thought of the kind of man that you would go steady with? My dream man? <laughs> oh, sure. But you just don't find them growing on trees. Not that kind. What kind, Dora? Oh, when I say dream man, don't get me wrong. I don't go for those glamour boys. I've been around enough to know better than that. You just give me a nice, Easy-going fellow with a steady job. <laughs> that, 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 that sounds like a description of me. <laughs> and a little money put away in the bank. That's the kind of fellow I want. Did you say money? Well, sure. A fellow's never going to get very far if he doesn't have a little late aside for a rainy day. Oh, yes. Uh, Isn't that right? Yes, I suppose that is right. But uh, how much money do you think such a fellow ought to have? Oh, thousand dollars. You know, just something for kind of a little nest egg. Little, oh, yes, 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 of course, yes. Well, here's where I live. Thanks for the walk. Dora. Yeah? If you were to find such a man. Who? A man with a steady job and money in the bag. Oh, him. I mean, I mean would you, would you consider, I mean, would you, uh... Would I what? Oh, oh, I get it. Well, sure, if I thought I could make him happy. Oh. Why not? Well, till the uh, death do us part. <laughs> well, it was strange that she should have said that when death had parted me only a few brief hours before the, uh, from the only woman in my life, my mother. And now, so soon after, there was another woman, but here she was there. That, that, that thousand dollars, that stood in the way. With all the expense of the funeral still to be met, I knew that it would take me at least two years to accumulate such a sum. And Dora was a warm, attractive girl. I couldn't expect her to wait that long. It wouldn't be fair, so by, by the next morning, my first fond hope had turned to black despair. I hardly noticed Tom Bass when he sauntered into the store. Hiya, honey. Well, you know what's new. Oh. Oh. Meaning to ask you, the way you always call me Miss Dora, and I mean, the way you talk, it's so refined. Really? <laughs> I bet you had a real good education once, didn't you? No, not formally. But you see, my mother was a governess, and she always tried to give me the same advantages as she would the children under her care. My mother was a highly educated woman. Well, I knew it must be something like that. Anyway, you don't have to call me Miss Dora. I mean, <laughs> seeing we're kind of old friends. Oh. Uh, say, what was it you was going to tell me before? Oh, that was something about my mother. It's something she taught me. I, I'll never forget uh, it as long as I live. You happened to remind me of it when you remarked how Mr. Kelsey trusted me. Well, what was it? Uh, well, it was just before my 11th birthday... There was a motion picture that I wanted to see very badly. Actually, it was something about cowboys, I think. But my mother said we couldn't afford it. And so I, I took ten cents from her purse, and she found it out. What'd she say? Well, she uh, whipped me. It was the only time she ever did, uh, until I could hardly walk. <laughs> she said I'd done the worst thing that anyone could ever do, that I had been dishonest. I was a thief. <laughs> <laughs> you dishonest. Oh, that's a laugh. I never knew anybody more honest in all my life. Well, look at the way Mr. Kelsey yes, always... Yes, but only because of what my mother taught me. I've been grateful to her all my life. That I always will be. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. 
Well, they say honesty is the best policy, and I guess it is all right. But now you take Tom back. What about him? Well, I wouldn't exactly say he's dishonest, but he's sure having a lot more fun than you or me. But Dora, I'm I'm sure you'll agree that there are more important things in life than just having fun. Oh, sure, of course. I didn't mean it like that. And what I mean to say is, you you, you couldn't admire a fellow like this Bass, could you? Tom Bass? Oh, I should say not. Thinks he's so smart with his wisecracks and his cheap jokes. I wouldn't give him the time of day. Is there anyone that, that is to say, any man you do admire? Yeah, not me. Oh, I admire you, of course. Do you really? For sure. <laughs> but if you mean, do I go out steady with anyone? Uh-uh. Uh, in just a moment, suspense. Starring Charles Lawton. Hi, Billy. Hi, Dad. You're working kind of late on your bicycle, aren't you? Yeah, the old bike hasn't been getting going just right. Boy, did I puff up 2nd Street this morning. <laughs> just like the car, Billy, till I had that new Autolite Stay Full battery put in. Well, my boy, you just keep at it. I'm going in and coast along with Autolite batteries, spark plugs, and ignition systems on the suspense show. <laughs> Dad, if you want to listen to the Autolite show, you'd better stay out here in the garage with me. Why? Mom's got her bridge club in tonight. What? Why, yep. she doggone well knows I want to hear Charles Lawton. Buy all the drinks my stay full battery doesn't eat. I take it I... easy, Dad. Here comes Charles Lawton. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Charles Lawton in Anton Leder's production of An Honest Man. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. bed that night listening to the stillness and loneliness of the empty house and tried to bring my mother back to me. Freddy, my son, I must leave you now. I know that you will miss me, but you needn't, for you are strong. I shall not be worried about you. I have taught you well. Taught me well. For the first time, the meaning of those words became clear to me. Tears dried in my eyes, my jaws clenched. That was the woman, my mother, to whom I'd been closer than anyone else in the world. Indeed, I'd been close to no one but my mother in all my 44 years. And after the tears, a flood of memories passed before my eyes. And after the memories came the realization that I was glad. 